to think about it as a relationship is helpful because two different people doing exactly the same thing, saying the same words, wearing the same clothes, doing the same gestures, are not going to have the same outcome in a relationship. Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, the podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm Alexander Eth, and today we're so honored to walk the hidden paths of magic with practitioner and author, Denny Poisson. So why is magic a relationship instead of only the use of repetitive formulas found in a book? Why should we engage with spirits in our actual physical areas where we live? Why is magic about encouraging the unlikely and not conjuring the impossible? Well, Denny Poisson is the perfect person to ask. Denny is the proprietor of the excellent Foolish Fish YouTube channel where he explores foundational and nuanced approaches to esotericism and mysticism, as well as sharing wonderful reviews of esoteric publications and books, which are so needed in an ever-expanding occult publishing world. Denny's own book from Black Letter Press, entitled Hidden Paths, shares key transcripts from his many videos that explore things like why Denny talks to many entities, the difference between theurgy and thaumaturgy, how to avoid self-sabotage and practice, lessons learned in magic, and so many more topics. And these topics are exactly what we're talking about today, listeners. I honestly really enjoyed chatting with Denny, and I feel like we just scratched the surface. Denny is a sincere, super smart gentleman practitioner, and I know that you're going to love his insights. And now to help us uncork the uncommon, let's welcome Denny Poisson. Denny Poisson, thank you so, so much for taking the time and stopping by the Glitch Bottle podcast today. Oh, the pleasure is absolutely all mine, Alex. Thank you so, so much for having me on the show. It's a great honor. I've been listening to your show for a long time, you know. <laughs> really, well, this for me is like winning the Oscars, you know. It's fantastic. I'm, I'm so, so pleased to be here. It is so great because it's like an automatic response. When I hear your voice, I just want to lay back and take notes on the latest esoteric <laughs> books. So I'm going to try and resist that urge during this conversation. But the the honor is is certainly mine, Denny. And um I know many of the listeners have already picked up uh, a copy of your latest tome, uh, Hidden Paths. And I think probably, Denny, the best place to start would be to kick off where you start the book at the very beginning of the book with an introduction by the great Josephine McCarthy, who is so lovely. And Josephine says in the introduction to your book, quote, magic goes in search of us and then waits until we are ready to catch up with that power that so patiently and quietly keeps its presence until the right time appears and then something wonderful happens, unquote. So, so Denny, given that introduction by the great Josephine, when did magic go in search of you and when did it find you? Can you share with the, with the listeners a little bit? Well, uh, I suppose I've always been interested in the human experience. I remember my very first memory being two years old, sitting on the stairs at home, uh, thinking to myself, where was I before I was here? And of course, I asked my parents, you know, where do babies come from? And they completely misunderstood the question. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yes, those are, are, are my early memories. And then, of course, you know, I spent a lot of time as a kid in my own head. I was surrounded by peers who were watching a lot of television, and I wasn't allowed to watch very much television. My parents were very cognizant of uh, how much damage watching a lot of television was supposed to be for, for kids. And uh, of course, at the time, I really resented them for that. But um, uh, the result is that I spent a lot of time reading books and a lot of time in my own imagination and a lot of time really exploring the inner worlds 
at the same time as I was exploring the outer worlds. So that was kind of the set with which I arrived at the ideas of magic. When I was at university, I was in a very, very, very boring setting. I was in a very tiny seaside town, which only really came alive maybe once a year during the summer season, just for a couple of months. And then the rest of the year, it was kind of survival in this little place and very, very few people living there and so very little to do. So I spent some time exploring religions. I had been a, an atheist all my life and uh, I was keen to uh, have some tangible reasons for being an atheist. I, I wanted to say, okay, I'm an atheist, sure, but I want to, to be able to show why I'm an atheist. So I picked up a Bible and and actually started going through it and found that what was in there wasn't at all what I'd been expecting to be in there and all what I was told would be in there. And I tried a few of the bits of advice that are found in the New Testament, well, actually in the four Gospels and specifically the words attributed to Jesus of Nazareth and found that it was it worked. It worked. I, I, some crazy experiences started happening to me, right? So I was very interested in these experiences and I started going to various, and I mean various churches, various denominations, trying to find anyone who would have seen this with the same lens that I was seeing it. But no, they were very much interested in the, uh, in the social aspect. They were very much interested in the uh, political aspect. They were very much interested in the blind faith aspect and, you know, some things like this, which yeah, that wasn't what I just read. <laughs> right? So, so I was like, okay, no, I'm clearly going to have to do this on my own. And through experimentation, I guess, uh, through going, okay, this doesn't sound reasonable, but I'm going to try it on the terms that are given to me and I'll see what happens, right? I can't say, no, this doesn't work just because I don't think it's reasonable for it to work. I'll try it on the terms that are stated and we'll see. And and what came out of that has been a, a lifetime of discovery after discovery after discovery of just how reality works and how to have a, yeah, a relationship with reality. That's my introduction to magic. Yeah. One of the big themes of your book is to challenge the idea of materialism. And to that point, you actually share in your early childhood you said that you, you know, you just wanted to be normal, but I, cu <laughs> yeah. I, I couldn't help reading you sharing about your early childhood. And I thought of William Blake because you said that uh, there were early school reports saying, oh, Denny has his head in the clouds and he's just daydreaming all the time. And, and you share in the book that you used that as an early teaching lesson as you were engaging with reality and daydreaming and exploring that. And you were interacting with the world as if the world itself, the material realm was a dream. And yet the dream world was that malleable reality. Can you just share about, about your early childhood and, and, and how you were really challenging that idea of materiality? For sure. My dreams were very vivid, right? I was having recurring nightmares, but also uh, just a very rich dream life, asleep and awake, by the way, right? I mean, when I was supposed to be focusing on mathematics, that's really not where I was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I was realizing that these worlds were not necessarily being built by me, certainly not consciously built by me, but that they were, uh, these dream worlds were nevertheless happening within me. And so whenever I was being approached by, let's say, a character within the dream, right? So be having a dream and there's some people or some whoever it was, either well-intentioned or ill-intentioned, they would approach me and we'd have interactions. But then waking up, of course, I'd realize all of that was happening within me. All of these were ultimately me. They weren't external entities. They were the part of me that realized that it was me, was having a conversation with. And so I kind of drew a parallel with the waking world. And I suppose these are kind of certain concepts that arise in many religions that I suppose it's a platonic uh, concept, isn't it? That it is all one in the end, right? And so I was 
interacting with the world around me as if, and still do interact with the world around me as if it's an extension of the bigger me. But of course, we're all individual, naturally. Um, but ultimately, there are parts of us which join up, I think. But to talk about the malleability of the dream world and the waking world, that's a really nice thing because the dream world is so malleable, isn't it? You just need to, as long as if, if you've ever had a, a lucid dream experience, you'll know that all you need to do is to decide that there is going to be something around a corner and then you go around the corner and it's actually there, right? The waking world is less malleable than, than the dream world. It's a little bit more stable, but it's not much more stable. I mean, okay, maybe it is much more stable, but it's not completely stable. It does nevertheless have a malleable aspect to it. And discovering just how malleable it was through magic was very exciting, a very exciting journey. Denny, I'm probably butchering this, but I know in the book you have this lovely quote that has really stuck with me, which is, if magic is an experiment without you, and you might be the central part of the experiment, you are the central laboratory, if you will, then without without the operator, the magician, the esotericist, the practitioner, whatever we want to say, then the natural reality of the world simply moves on. But there's something about the relationship, and this is something you share again and again. Can you share with listeners about why is, you know, we hear this all the time, magic is a relationship. Why is the relationship aspect so important in, in esotericism? There's a fashion at the moment to say that magic is reproducible by absolutely anyone. You follow the steps and you should get the same results. And I think that this comes from just a different perspective <laughs> from mine. Just before we started recording, we were talking about my underlying presupposition for all of this, which is that the building block of the universe is mind. That's the core prima materia it's mind and that the material world arises out of mind and that we are receptors for that mind or and we are even effects of that mind and therefore we share in that big mind right most people have the presupposition that no the building blocks of the universe are material the atom or whatever might be well the philosophical concept of the atom and then you get the atoms in the right configuration and they generate mind. So that's what most people are coming from. They're coming from the perspective that we are little meatballs that create individual minds. And how can such a mind have an effect on the material world? That to me doesn't make sense, which is why the philosophical idealist perspective appeals to me so much. This idea that before anything, there is mind, and then mind divides itself into parts of itself, and within mind, the material world is, is just a part, right? So that also means that we are sharing in this mind, and we are of the same nature as the mind, and therefore we are of the same nature as all of this that we perceive as material. We are of the same nature, and so just in the same way as if you scoop up a little glass of water from a larger pool and you add a little bit of ink into this glass of water and then you pour it all back into the larger pool, that ink is going to spread all over the place, right? Because that water that the ink was in is, is of the same nature as the larger pools. So it does make sense for us to be able to have an effect on the world around us because the world around us is an aspect of mind as well. So that's like a little, <laughs> little primer <laughs> for the, the answer that comes next. And then, well, what magic is from my perspective is a way of living in harmony with what surrounds us. And by what surrounds us, I mean, <laughs> I mean ourselves as well. I mean life. I mean the universe. I mean the, the, the material world. I mean the parts of the universe that surround us that aren't sensed by the our five senses. And so it's just literally a way of being with those things that surround us. But I think that 
to think about it as a relationship is helpful because two different people doing exactly the same thing, saying the same words, wearing the same clothes, doing the same gestures are not going to have the same outcome in a relationship. And I think it was on your podcast, Alex. I've been looking for the source of this, but at some point I heard this beautiful description and I've been trying to work out who said it. And I've reached out to a couple of practitioners that I know, but they've all said to me, I'm, I'm sorry, no idea. But this is the example that I heard at some point. Please, listeners, reach out. Let me know who said this. Somebody said, magic is like going on a date. So this was specifically talking about evocation and talking to a spirit. If you go on a date and you wear particular clothes and you say particular things and you go to a particular restaurant and you order from the menu and the conversation flows and it's very enjoyable and, you know, the chemistry happens and, ah, yeah, at the end of the night, things go very well, right? And then maybe a couple of days later, you decide that you want to go on a second date. You thought, well, that first date went really well. Okay, I'll wear the same clothes. We'll go to the same restaurant. We'll make sure that we order the same food. We'll make sure that we have the same conversations. I'll, I'll direct the conversation in exactly the same way. We'll, I'll say the same words. I'll, you know, etc. That's no guarantee <laughs> that, the, <laughs> that, the, that the date is going to go well, right? Possibly on the contrary. What's important in a relationship is to come to it with your genuine self and to interact with what's in front of you, not to follow the recipe, right? That's an attitude that's worked for me in magic. I mean, I, I know that following recipes is an attitude that, that's worked for others as well. But yeah, my perspective is certainly that thinking about magic as a relationship is, uh, is helpful. I love that, Denny, because mm. you push back on a lot of those misconceptions that people might have about whether it's esotericism in general or whether it's the grimoires and one of the ways that you do that and you extend this relationship metaphor and reality is you share in your book that quote and i love this what probably should be you say but rarely is the most natural approach to magic which is to work with the spirits which exist natively in the very places where you stand unquote I love this because it breaks that misconception of I can only access spirits if they are in an official grimoire from, you know, 1643. Wow. So can you share, Denny, why is this approach, this, you know, natural approach, if you will, working with local spirits? Why do you think it's so ignored? And why do you think it's so important for people to explore that? I think that the reason why people go for well-known spirits, the main reason for this is because it's what the grimoires give us as instructions. And people come to magic with needing to know, how do I do this, right? And so the grimoires actually tell us exactly what to do. And they are fantastic tutorials. They are fantastic examples of what magicians have done before us that has worked for them. So it's probably going to work for us. And yeah, people do try out the experiments of the grimoires and they work very well. These are entities that have now been well supported through regular evocation. And so they tend to be quite easy to call, right? But they are far from being the only spirits that exist. And so my opinion is that as much as it's great to support the top 10 uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> you know, to enjoy the company of the big and famous, the spirits who are right here, wherever you live, very often get neglected. And they are the ones with whom you can build the best relationships, the most lasting relationships, the most meaningful relationships. I guess it's a little bit like your best friend who lives down the road versus your big famous acquaintance, <laughs> right? <laughs> I think that's, that's the best way for me to put it, I think. And the spirits who live close by are often the ones who need our support because 
well, we often see the environments in which we live maybe going downhill or the state of the roads getting bad and, you know, things like this. And we think to ourselves, ah, oh, well, I'll just call that big famous spirit and that big famous spirit will fix it. But, uh, but actually, you know, we should be probably just helping out the spirit of this particular place who needs some some support, who needs some some energy, who needs some something, right? Absolutely. And in fact, Denny, you'll have to keep me on point here, but I believe in the fourth book of occult philosophy, near the end of, of the actual fourth book proper, I believe it even has instructions for that. It says, you know, if, if you are out in the forest and you would like to engage with the spirits there, it literally says, you know, set out a table, put milk and honey and offerings and chairs. And when I thought of the fourth book, I thought of your excellent reminder to readers and hidden paths about it's that relationship again, right? It just comes back to that theme. Yes, yes, yes. I think Jason Miller in his latest book, Consorting with Spirits, he's got a very, very beautiful feast for spirits that he describes where yeah he's just putting a lot of really nice foods out and saying hey any spirits who are around if you'd like some go for it <laughs> that's kind of the, <laughs> the idea and i think that's really really nice yeah fully you recommend in hidden paths denny quote if you are going to work though with well-known spirits you know maybe those the top 10 as you say you you, yes. you mention go with the spirits from a culture that you have at least some connection to, unquote. And of course, you you say in the book, hey, you know, always, of course, explore different, you know, different cultures and check out different things and explore to your heart's content. But this is such a great point. Can you share why is it so important to, as as you say in the book, quote, work within your zone of familiarity with spirits? Mm, yes. Thank you very much for bringing this up. It's uh, it's quite important, I think. And it's quite controversial, surprisingly. But yes, I, I can understand why it's controversial. But here's my thinking. We grow up with a particular set of values, but also a set of symbols. We grow up believing pretty much what our environment believes. Okay, there, there are some differences, of course, but many of the underlying assumptions about symbols tend to be similar. And, you know, a particular color is going to be associated with a particular way of feeling. And another particular color will be associated with the idea of death or the other color will be associated with the idea of anger or something like this. You might rebel against these ideas, but they're ingrained in us. So I've just given colors as an example, but this is pervasive. It's in every single aspect of of our language, of our ways of thinking of the world around us, our way of relating to the world around us. And if we go to another culture, well, we're going to need to learn those assumptions, those core ingrained assumptions that are so deep that we don't even think of them as assumptions. We think of them as just the way reality works, right? And I think that magic does do a great job of using those keys to unlock reality. It goes for those core assumptions and it, it uses them by subverting them, by making us observe them, using certain words that are going to trigger certain ideas or feelings within us, right? So it, it changes the way we feel the way we exist, right? Uh, when we hear certain words, when we, when we say certain words, it's going to make us feel in a, in a particular way that's going to be good for doing magic, whatever. But then if you're using a magic system of another culture and you don't have those ingrained assumptions, then the magic doesn't have maybe as many of those keys to work with, if that makes sense. That doesn't mean that you can't learn to be a part of that culture, right? If, for example, you live in a culture where your magic system has been completely spoiled for you for whatever awful reason you can imagine, then yeah, it's many people's choice to then go to another culture's systems and then you have to learn how to be a part of that culture, right? You have to learn to think like that culture. You have to learn to exist like a member of that culture. 
Yeah, it's not an easy thing to do. So I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying if you have the option, your existing culture way of being is definitely the easiest path. That is so lovely, Denny. And tell me if you resonate with this too, because truly just yesterday I was reading an old blog post from the excellent Munich-based uh, magician and author Frater Acher, who I know you know works with Josephine McCarthy very yes. closely and is, yes. is you know is is so wonderful. And Such a fun. Same, absolutely. And he had a series of blog posts talking about his working of the Arbitel. And again, Frater Acher, if, if you're hearing this, please forgive me. I'm going to totally paraphrase and condense down probably incorrectly. But he had this lovely point that I think echoes what you just said, which is, as Frater Acher narrates, he says, you know, as I was engaging in this ritual of the Arbitel, he said, you know, I was, of course, part of the evocations, the invocations, the conjurations are these Christian names and these divine names and the kind of monotheistic Judeo-Christian tradition. But he said he has this lovely point, which is uttering the names. He's like, I can I now understood why it was a good thing, why I didn't change anything. It doesn't matter if I personally believe in the Judeo-Christian tradition. But the point is, you know, you are stepping into those tributaries, those laid down energy grids, if you will. Is that somewhat fair in terms of uh, echoing what, what you're saying? Percent that that's exactly what I'm what I'm reaching out at. And uh, yes, and I read that same post and uh, I, I get fully, fully behind it. If you can leave it in in the description, that'd be <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people will be very, very interested in that. Yeah. Very, very cool stuff. Yeah. You talk about the first time that you prayed for something and you're mm. and the first time engaging with the divine, you know, in the monotheistic sense. And you share just I love this story in the book, listeners. You'll you'll love it when you read it, when you pick up your copy of Hidden Paths. You share just such an incredibly charming and just lovely narrated story about how you asked God for something for the first time as you were trying to catch a train. Yes. And then when you prayed with specificity, taking the advice of one of your friends, I believe, for a car to take you back to Essex in the south of England. Can you share a little bit about this story and why is it so important to be very specific when you request uh, something? I think telling the whole story might take the rest of our time here. <laughs> Nevertheless, just a, a synopsis is that I was in a very uncomfortable situation, a situation where I just wasn't sure how I was going to get out of it, basically. So this happened maybe two months, maybe three months after I'd followed the advice in Matthew 6, uh, verses 5 to 8, where Jesus says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who like to stand in the houses of God to be seen by many men. Uh, but when you pray, go to your room, lock the door and pray in secret, more or less, that's paraphrasing. I did that and I uh, had a response, an experienced response, a, a felt response. I go into the way I felt the response a little bit more in the book, but for intents and purposes, this weird thing that happened to me happened about two or three months after this. and. You could say that I'd been really very, very much in the Bible for about six months by now. And I was in this terrible situation. And I thought to myself, there's little point in my having this relationship with the thing that Jesus of Nazareth was calling the Father. If I'm not going to call on some favors at this point, right? I mean, I, I literally don't know how I'm going to get out of this. So. I did. I prayed and I wasn't getting anywhere with my prayers. And it's when I just remembered a friend who'd been interested in the fact that I was interested in the Bible, who had said to me, hey, you've got to be really specific with your prayers. And I thought at the time that it was a really arrogant thing to consider, but I thought that I've got really nothing to lose. So I was really, really specific with my prayer. And the exact thing that I prayed for, I mean, to the letter, it was shocking how accurate, how, how exact it was, just happened within the five minute time frame that I'd given as the time frame that I was after, right? And the fact that this worked so well made me then think about really how the universe works 
And yes, I mean, I could have just left it at that, you know, and and just become a member of the church. But I wanted a better explanation than this. And the explanation that I've arrived at certainly doesn't preclude any uh, divine relationship, but it does point to the ways in which reality is malleable. And I explore this idea in one of my very early videos. I talk about quantum mechanics for the magus. I think that's the name of the video. I think this must have been my fourth or fifth video that I did, uh, where I talk about the way that the universe is fixed in the present moment, but in the past, it's not so fixed. And in the future, it's also not so fixed. I read this wonderful book by Greg Egan, his prose isn't wonderful, but his ideas are incredible. The book itself is called Quarantine, a fantastic book that explains quantum mechanics in very approachable ways. The idea is that for every fixed state in the present that has been observed, right, there have in the past and there will be in the future many probabilities that all exist simultaneously. And actually, um, quantum computers are currently harnessing this fact that on the quantum level, particles exist in many different states at the same time, and in many different places at the same time as well. Anyway, so lots and lots of different possibilities. And we kind of collapse those possibilities by observing them into one single possibility, only one single possibility remains. And so by being specific, in the thing you're praying for, my hunch, okay, this is nothing more than a hunch. My hunch is that you're pre-observing the specific possibility that you're looking for, right? And so you're, you're not guaranteeing that that's the possibility that's going to arise, but you're giving that possibility among millions a better chance. You're giving that possibility more weight, right? So that when it comes to culling off the possibilities and only one remaining, that's the one that's got a better chance than the others of remaining. That's why being specific with your prayers is, is kind of important. It's also important not to pray for the thing you don't want. Okay, don't let this happen. Right? This is a terrible thing to pray for. <laughs> right? <laughs> please, please don't let me fall in that hole. Uh, <laughs> you know? So, because you, of course, you're that, that's the possibility that you're reinforcing. Through my observations, this works. It, it, it works exactly the way I guessed it would work. It doesn't mean to say that that's how it works. It means that my experience is that that's how it has worked for me. Yes. In the Getting Magic to Work for You chapter, you say, and I love this quote, real world magic is about encouraging the unlikely, not conjuring the impossible. Why is it important that magic is not conjuring the impossible, that magic is not, you know, this kind of Disney-esque wish fulfillment? Yes, yes, yes. In my latest video, I talk about magic not being a vending machine. I think that's kind of to that point. Many people do come to magic with needs. I'd say that that's a, probably a built-in positive attractor. <laughs> but it's not necessarily the way it works. I was just talking about possibilities in the future or probabilities in the future. Probability is really the chance of one possibility surviving into the observed present. That kind of covers the answer, my answer to your question really, because there has to be a possibility in the future for you to actually reach it, right? For you to actually get to the point when it's the present and it's realized, it's actually happened. There has to be one of the possibilities has to be the one that you're after. If it's not one of the possibilities, then when you get to that moment in the present, it's just not going to be available to you, right? It's just not one of the possibilities that's going to be available to you. As you get closer to the crunch point, to the observed present point, fewer and fewer of these possibilities arise. So if we're talking about my life next week, I'm unlikely to be a billionaire gambling kingpin in Saigon 
<laughs> whatever, right? Saigon would have to exist once again, right? I mean, that so many things would have to change in one week. That's just not one of the possibilities that's available, right? It's just not a possibility that's available. Is it possible that I will not be living in this particular flat? Yes, it is actually a possibility, right? That's something that's possible. So if that's the thing that I want to change, then that's the possibility that I need to focus on. But uh, this is another thing a lot of people really want to win the lottery. And it's possible to win the lottery. That's great. Yes. But magic is about giving more weight to one of the possibilities. Winning the lottery is like one in, I don't even know what the numbers are. It's billions, isn't it? It's a lot. It's too much. Right. So if you're increasing that possibility by even 10,000, you're still way, way far <laughs> from, from managing to make sure that the possibility that arises, the possibility that, that you get to. So, yeah, winning at blackjack is a little bit more reasonable <laughs> if that's the kind of thing that you want to be doing with your magic. Yeah, you've got to be focusing on the things that have a, a more or less high probability. And this is actually something that I recommend to my readers and my, my viewers is to start off magic not necessarily with small things, but with possible things, so that you're diminishing the probability of something happening, not necessarily increasing the size of the thing happening, right? That's where the difficulty is. It's the probability that you want to be decreasing. You can do as many Jupiterian, Jovian uh, magical rituals to uh, get a better position of, or place of employment. But if you never apply, if you never send in an application, then that's impossible. You know, you, you could do as many mercurial, Raphaelian, mercury, planetary spirit operations to win the lottery. But yes. if you never buy a ticket, you know, it's just not going to happen. Right. Would that be kind of fitting into that? A little yes, bit? yes, yes, yes. If you're not generating the conditions for the thing that you're asking for to be a possibility, then yeah, that possibility is out of existence before you even get there, right? I mean, it's it's just not not one of the options. You want to be choosing one of the options that exist. And if the option that exists isn't there, then you need to be working in the direction that is going to make that possibility exist in the future, right? You want to be changing your life in a way to make the options that you're after available to you. You delineate such an interesting journey in Hidden Paths of exploring Christianity, monotheism, Sethian Gnosticism. If you could just share with the listeners some of the some of the broad strokes of that journey. And I think a good place to start is you you mentioned in the book that you consider yourself a Christian, yet you also say that you avoid organized forms of Christianity. Can you share about how it's very important to follow the spirit of the law over the letter of the law. And, and really, instead of the writings of Paul or, you know, we have letters, you know, with Peter, you know, the second letter of Peter, et cetera, following the direct sayings of Jesus. Can you share a little mm. bit about that? Yeah, I was having a conversation with a viewer a few weeks ago, actually, talking about my take on Christianity. And I think that the main difference between my take and most Christians take is that my take is that I see the rest of the Bible through the lens of the four Gospels, and most Christians see the entirety of the Bible, including the four Gospels, through the lens of their church. And that's just not how I came to the whole thing, right? I didn't come to Christianity through a, an organization. I came to it through reading the words attributed to Jesus of Nazareth and going, I, well, I completely agree with that. How come I didn't assume that I would agree with, with this? How come I assumed that he was saying something completely different, right? The result really was that I was not particularly interested in the church by the time I'd finished reading the Bible because Jesus was not particularly interested in his organized religions, right? He was, in, on the contrary, rather critical of them. A lot of his views are about stop being so judgmental, right? I mean, do not judge with the same amount as you have judged, you will also be judged. And this is something that I regularly see other Christians completely missing 
because they're seeing all of this from the perspective of their church rather than through the perspective specifically of the four gospels, right? So obviously from there, I wanted more of Jesus's writing. So when I found out that there were more, I was like, oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> Fantastic. So, so yeah, reading Philip K. Dick's Vallis, which blew my mind, absolutely <laughs> blew my mind. It introduced me to the Nag Hammadi library. And so, of course, I went through that. And yeah, again, very, very strange text, right? Very, very different from what we understand Christianity to be through the church, through, through what has become the standardized Christianity, right? Very, very different view, very, very different approach. And I really, of course, really engaged with the Gospel of Thomas. That's what really got me. But because the Gospel of Thomas was presented in the context of all these other texts, the Apocryphon of John also kind of got in there. <laughs> I was like, that is something very, very heavy to take on, this idea that the Creator God is not this very good thing, right? This very good entity, and that there is a level of God above the Creator God. And of course, much later, I started to see this in the context of mind and levels of mind and the so-called Creator God being the aspect of ourselves that does like to categorize things and to get things in chokehold so that we can have a control over them and things like this, right? Different ways of relating to these narratives. The point is that, yes, I did spend a bit of time in my life going, yeah, no, uh, how do I reconcile my love for the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth with this concept that the Creator God is evil. So yes, there was a time in my life when I really struggled with that. And the missing element came to me quite a bit later when actually going through Jack Grail's course on the Hell Hecate course, where I really engaged with the concept of the Divine Feminine, quite simply. I just finished reading Apuleius's Metamorphosis and well, The Golden Ass, which is this very salacious novel, which ends with some very, very beautiful evocations of the goddess. And yes, everything that I was hearing through Jack Grail's course really spoke to this idea that this one goddess was being called by many different names. The revelation, really, that the material world was ignored by the church and in fact, not just ignored, but reviled by the church. The fact that the material world is nevertheless a part of mind and to pretend that it doesn't exist or to wish it away is not the way ahead. We need to be a bridge to both worlds. We, we need to fully embrace our material existence because it's a part of mind and our spiritual existence because it's a part of mind. And we have access to all these different layers, these different levels of reality. And yeah, I think it's important to embrace our role as bridge between the worlds and not just wish one part away just because the other part is some people hope that it'll be better, right? That it'll be easier or, or whatever it might be. We really should be using our access to the spiritual world to heal the material world. I, I strongly, strongly believe that. Denny, would it be fair to say, um, as you shared about this, that Gnosticism initially is very alluring because it says, oh my, especially for people who might be disillusioned with the kind of institutional structured religion and oh my goodness, there's this hidden veil of reality and there's this evil demiurge that's just creating things you know out of out of just this malice and contempt and trapping the shards of sophia of wisdom in reality but it sounds like what you're saying is you know yes gnosticism of course it has it has excellent value but you you need to be sure that it doesn't turn into a, a mental trap where all of a sudden materiality is this thing to be reviled and denied and one must only theurgistically ascend their soul would that be yes. In, yes. in in the yes. ballpark yes yes okay. absolutely and i think that you get there in the end mm. um <laughs> right and i think that it is a journey and i think that it's it's okay to have that as a step in your journey 
but yes, I think that for many people who are getting into Gnosticism and who are feeling very anxious about, well, how how do I now, you know, speak to angels because they're evil and you know how <laughs> things like this, right? It, it doesn't have to be the last step. <laughs> I guess that's what I'm saying, right? Can you elaborate a little more on this concept that you trace out so well in, in Hidden Paths, which is the divine feminine, that the two other aspects of reality, if you will, as, as part of that reality of mind is there's the divine masculine and there's the divine child, but it's really the divine feminine that complements both of those pieces. And does the divine feminine also act as kind of a a kind of a mollifying, balming unifier, you know, and it kind of brings everything together. I don't know if that's overstating it, but what what are your thoughts on it? I don't know about the divine feminine being a, a unifier, but uh, the divine feminine is a missing piece. And so, if the divine feminine isn't included in the whole, then you're only working with half of the picture, or two thirds of the picture, should I say, right? And of course, you're going to be confused, you know, and and is going to result in some mistakes, such as hatred towards the material world, for example. In one of the chapters of Hidden Paths, why I talk to many entities, you share that yes, you are a monotheist, and you employ a very specific model of quote a single consciousness within which all of what we perceive to be the unfolding of space-time exists. Now, you've touched on this. This is kind of that underlying theme of, of a lot of the perspectives and the, and the reality that you bring to your practice. But can you elaborate on, on that, especially for listeners who maybe this is the first time they're hearing about this kind of, you know, mind is all. Can you share a little bit more about that? Yes. This really, as you were saying, encompasses everything that we've been talking about so far. The idea that there is I hesitate to use the word big mind because it's trademarked. I used a vast mind in my ripoff of <laughs> vast mind, yes. <laughs> right. So this vast mind that we can, by the way, experience. Uh, Dennis Genpo Merzel's big mind process really allows someone to have a just a flash, like a, a brief insight into the way everything is just one gigantic mind. And it's really, really great. As I say, I, I do like a rip-off version on, <laughs> on my channel. Uh, and within this vast mind, which is a perfect description of what Jesus calls the Father, right? This great mind, the great mind has definition, has crystallizations of itself. <laughs> I don't know if that's a perfect description, but these crystallizations are defined against each other, right? So, this crystallization is not that crystallization. This aspect is not that aspect, but they are all the mind. To your very point, what would you share with listeners who might be, I don't want to say stuck, but they might be in the opposite mindset, which is everything has a hierarchical structure to it. Everything fits into a neat little 777 box. And everything is very reified. There's this very concretized, I cannot practice esotericism unless I divide everything into excellent, neat little correspondence tables, you know? And, and it sounds like you're saying there's nothing wrong with that. that. That's absolutely an aspect of reality. But once you begin to see things as all mind, it just changes the game, really. I love your example of people, yes, liking categories. I think that this categorization, it can be helpful at the beginning of a journey because it shows you how everything works. And in fact, categorizations is how a lot of sympathetic magic works, where you're saying, okay, this isn't the same category as something else, and therefore I can use it to affect another thing, right? That is in the same category to represent it. That's wonderful. And in fact, it's the way many people begin in their magical journey. But yes, once you realize that everything is one, then you also realize that the limits between the categories are man-made, right? And therefore malleable, and therefore also not, I want to use the word categorical, but they're not definite, right? You, you can't say, okay, this is the limit between the two categories. 
the next person is going to say, actually, no, the limit is here, you know, it's somewhere else. And so you end up with these arguments about something that's not real. I mean, it's real for the individual, but it's not objectively real. So yeah, categories, I think, can end up getting in the way if you get too hung up by them. I think they're a useful tool to get started. Can you share some of the broad strokes, Denny, about how, quote, you say, I strongly suspect that most of the modern Western magic traditions are basically a reskin of Tantra, unquote. Can you share with us about the basics of, of how Tantric practice or Tantric information informs your practice? Mm, yes. Again, many modern practitioners come to magic through the lens of turn of the century, late 19th century, early 20th century lodge magicians. And those lodge magicians were reinvigorating the occult scene, trying to rediscover magic to the best of their ability and to the best of their ability, given the research that was available to them at the time. Right. Obviously, we have much better research now, but what they had available to them was, yes, a few good grimoires, not necessarily the best versions of those grimoires, not necessarily the best manuscript, original texts of those grimoires, but nevertheless, some good grimoires. And what they also had was, we have to think about the geopolitical context of the time. They were mostly from England, who was an empire at the time, and uh, they were present in India. And just like the Romans invading Judea, <laughs> right, who had just invaded Greece 200 years previously and then came together with Judaism with this Greek information to create Christianity, in the same way, the British invaders of India also discovered the mystical aspects of the local practitioners and uh, were clearly very interested in all of this. Some of it was awfully abused, some of it was clearly just appropriated in, in terrible ways, but the result was that the people who were trying to revive an occult practice in the UK at the time had access to some new information. That information was clearly very interesting and very useful and very workable. And so they realized that using Tantra in the UK for a UK based audience would just not work because of what we talked about earlier in this podcast, that we have a particular set of assumptions, a particular set of symbols that we work with. Magic has to unlock or use those locks or keys to work within us. And well, we British people don't have an Indian mindset, right? Which Tantra is designed to work with. So the yeah, occultists of the late 19th and early 20th centuries tried to replicate what Tantra was to the Indian people within a Western context. The outcome of that, of course, is that we have some misunderstandings on, for example, what the left-hand path is supposed to be. And again, this is something that I, I go into in some of my videos, and, and I, think I, I think there's a chapter about it in the book. A lot of Westerners come to the left-hand path thinking to themselves, well, it just means that I can do whatever I want, and I can just be a, a bad person, and it's a spiritual path. But no, that's, <laughs> that's not the point. That's not the point at all. The idea of Tantra is that there is a, an overall mind and <laughs> that there is a, a divine feminine and uh, that the two are indispensable to each other. And so once again, our ideas that come out in the Golden Dawn in Philema and so on. That was just such excellent context, Denny. And I, I know listeners will really appreciate that. By the way, listeners, just to pause here really quick, one of the many reasons why Denny is so good at lucidly and clearly explaining things in his videos and in his book is, Denny, you also were a religious studies uh, teacher as well. Can you share just a little bit about that? Because one of the things that I think you say in the book, and, and forgive me if I'm butchering this, is that 
one of the things you really emphasized with your students is you wanted to communicate to them this idea of that all pervasive, you know, vast mind. I mean, can you share about the importance of, yeah, your experience with being a religious studies teacher? Right, right, right. I um, was looking for a job. <laughs> Excellent reason. Excellent right, reason. Right, right, right. <laughs> I came out of uh, hospitality management school, right? And uh, knowing that I would never get into that industry after having spent four years, whatever it was, uh, studying in that field, I just needed a, a different path. And so I started teaching English as a foreign language, but you can't really teach English as a foreign language in the UK and make a living. So I had to learn something else. And I thought, you know what, both my new wife and I are very interested in religions. We know a little bit about them. And so, yeah, so let's study. Let's go and do a postgraduate degree and and learn to be teachers of religious studies. I was very, very lucky to be taken in by a Catholic school who had a head of department in the religious studies department who was just wonderful. And he wanted a, not necessarily a Catholic, but somebody who could give a world religions perspective to his students. And that was very, very forward thinking and very, very open of him. And so I got this opportunity for about five, six years teaching, yeah, religious studies. And yeah, giving some of the classes <laughs> just a wider perspective of the religion that, well, the other religious studies teachers were giving them just straight up catechism, right? And I was trying to give them a little bit of external perspective on why some of the things that they learned worked and why some of the things that they learned were being taught in that way, and but also what they could get out of it anyway and things like that, right? Yeah, it was a very, very rewarding experience, very rewarding time in my life that had to come to an end, unfortunately, because teachers are paid so badly. And when my son was born with a disability, many disabilities, actually, uh, well, I just realized I didn't have the time to spend, you know, from eight o'clock in the morning till midnight, pretty much every day working, you know, marking and preparing lessons and so on and so forth. I, I had to do something else. So that's when I went into IT. But yes, a lovely, lovely time in my life that I'm I miss my students a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Those are some very lucky students, but I think we can count. I know, I know myself, and I, I know the you know many, many, many millions of people who have listened to your videos are also lucky because that that ability that you have is just so rejuvenating to lucidly and succinctly and yet deeply inform uh, people about complex topics and just able to distill that is. I'm so blushing out. <laughs> uh, it's, the, it's, it's truly so so lovely. In fact, Denny, uh, one of the very ways that you that you do this so well, you share about some excellent early magical lessons that I know we can all benefit from. And one of them is what you call quote probably the most important early magical lesson. You say, "I wish I'd known the difference between theurgy." and thaumaturgy, unquote. Can you give us the broad strokes, Denny, about you know well, what is the difference between theurgy and, and thaumaturgy and, and why is it so important to get that early on, that distinction? For sure. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I'm now surrounded by mostly practitioners for whom the difference between theurgy and thaumaturgy is just completely obvious and you know why would you even bring it up, which is the very reason why people arriving at the topic of magic, just don't get that information. They're like, okay, well, it's magic, but I mean, what, what is magic? I mean, is it, you know, Mickey Mouse <laughs> you know, conjuring the stars and, <laughs> and, and, you know, making your broomstick uh, sprout legs and arms, or is it something else? And, and then they start reading the works of Alistair Crowley and they're very confused. And is it about changing myself? Is it about changing the world around me? Well, what is it? There are many, many, many different aspects to magic. And yeah, again, we're getting into categorizations here, but there are two useful categories, I think, which are theurgy and thaumaturgy. And theurgy, in my opinion, is where the local self is allowing for the higher self to take over. And I suppose thaumaturgy is where the lower self is influencing the higher self. <laughs> I guess that's, that's the best way I can really put it. So yes, theurgy is where you are 
I don't know if denying yourself is completely right, but it's certainly in that direction. There's this idea of ego death, which is which sounds terribly violent. But yes, in order for a cup to be filled, the cup must be emptied first of all. And theurgy really is about allowing the higher self's values and ideas to pervade the lower self, the local self, what you might call me, right, <laughs> in, in、uh, your everyday life. That's great, but then your higher self, or some people might call it the holy guardian angel. Some people might call it God, right? The higher self doesn't have experience of being alive. What you have, but though you do have experience of being alive, right? So that's an, a part of experience that you just know something about that your higher self doesn't know something about. Your higher self has got a very good idea of what's good for you. Higher self's got a very good idea of where your path lies, what you should be doing with your life, things like this. But your higher self has never had to pay bills. Your higher self has never had expectations from their family to go and visit. <laughs> <You know? laughs> things like this, right? Just, just everyday considerations, just responsibilities in the real material world. And so we have a responsibility to push back sometimes and say, "Hey, do you know what?" Completely agree. You know, we should be doing this. Is there another way to do it? Because I, I just can't this week, or <laughs> whatever it might be. You know, because of the realities of being alive. So I think that thaumaturgy, which is where you're saying, "Hey, can you get this done?" Where your lower self is saying, "Hey, can you help me out in the material world and and change my my living conditions and." The world around me and and the things that are happening in the world. Can you can you change this stuff? That's thaumaturgy. I think it needs to work hand in hand with theurgy, where your lower self is also saying, "I don't have all the answers. I don't know really what's the best thing to do. I do know what's the best thing for me from my local self's perspective, but I don't have a bigger perspective the way you do." Right. So sure. Make some of the decisions for me, but we need to work hand in hand. It needs to be a, like a collaboration, and I think that that's actually what the LBRP is about. It's about establishing that collaboration. I think that's not necessarily what many people think of the LBRP as. I think many people think of it as being a, like a, a cleansing ritual, something like this. And for for me, yes, the cleansing is like a side effect.、Uh, <laughs> I think of the LBRP yeah as a synchronizing dance between your lower self and your higher self. You push back and kind of break so many misconceptions, and one of them that I love that you do in Hidden Paths that you share about is, I very much appreciate you push back against this idea of being a couch magician as a negative thing, saying, "Hey, we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't be using terms like this." So, can you please share, Denny, about? Why only you? Meaning only the individual listener listening to this right now. Only you will know when you want to try things out, to experiment, to experience. And even if you never try things out, why that's totally okay too. Can you can you elaborate on that a、There's、little bit? There's so much judgment in the world of magic. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yes, you're doing the wrong magic. You're doing it wrong. You're doing it too late. You're doing it too early.、You're, You've got the wrong idea of how it works, etc., etc. Oh my goodness,、mm-hmm. it's so off-putting, and many people do just. <laughs> you know what? It's fine. I'll just stick to my parents' religion. <laughs> you know, at least, at least, you know, there's one way of doing it, and because、um, there isn't one way of doing magic, each individual comes to magic with their own person, and you know, as I say over and over again, the person doing the magic is one of the ingredients of the magic, and so your magic is not going to be the same as the next person's magic. So you can't be taking. Orders from another person. I know that there's a big tradition of teacher and pupil, and you know there's definitely value in that. I'm certainly not going to deny that. But there is no way that another individual can know better than you when you're ready and when you're not ready to do a particular thing. 
being a couch magician is such a negative term. <laughs> But if that's what you enjoy doing, hey, be a couch magician. There's nothing wrong in being a couch magician. Obviously, you know, don't go telling a practitioner that they're practicing wrong either, you know, but no, there's nothing wrong in just studying the magic and, and learning what people have done in the past and, you know, even speculating on how it might work. That's fine. You know, yes, there is value in doing it yourself and experiencing it. For yourself, there is. It's undeniable. But it's okay if you want to practice a lot, practice a little bit, practice, you know, like this, like that, not practice at all. It's your life. You do what you want with it. <laughs> it's okay. And this, I believe, follows something that you touched on um, in, in one of the early questions of this podcast, which is, I mean, look, if you were to line up 100 people and they were all practicing from the Heptameron or the Lamegaton's Goetia or one of these, you know, famous grimoires, you will be getting 100 different ways to do it, 100 different emphases on the conjurations, 100 different ways of variations with making the materia magica and the tools. Like even people who say, ah, oh, well, this is only, there's only one way to do this. That's completely disproven by the fact that even if people are doing the same ritual, they're going to be idiosyncratic about it, right? I mean, come on. That's right. That's right. That's right. You come to magic with your set, with what you're already thinking with what your baggage is, with what your life has been so far, with, yeah, with your preferences, with your dislikes and so on and so forth. And yeah, you're going to put more emphasis on what it is you need. And it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> you have these lovely and well-crafted tutorial videos that you share with the viewers and with the listeners. And one of those tutorials that you share in the book and also on the Foolish Fish YouTube channel is sigils and sigil creation. Broadly speaking, Denny, why is sigil creation so important and, and effective for a magician, for someone who's engaged in esotericism? Oh, that's a good question. I would temper the word important. I think that it's a really nice, easy place to start. I think that a lot of the difficulty in magic comes from your unconscious mind pushing back, going, do you know what? I'm sorry. You've spent your whole life proving to yourself and telling yourself and being surrounded with other people who tell you that magic doesn't exist. So you're now asking me to change my opinion on that just on the basis that you've decided that it should be that way. And your unconscious mind doesn't work that way. Your unconscious mind doesn't work through persuasion doesn't work through language. It works through experience, right? So repeated experience is going to be what your unconscious mind accepts. And so, uh, yeah, doing some sigil magic, which is kind of accessible to anyone. Grant Morrison made sigil magic particularly popular during the late 90s. Yeah, obviously, I would imagine Austin Osman Spare is probably one of the main guys behind this. But yes, anyone can do it. Very, very simple. And it's just giving your unconscious mind repeated examples of where magic has worked, right? So simple magic, easy magic, as long as you're asking to increase the likelihood of something possible and not, you know, asking for the impossible. Yeah, sigil magic is a really great way of doing that. Thaumaturgic, of course, right? You're, you're not asking to become a, <laughs> a better person, more in line with your higher self or anything like this. But yeah, you can create a sigil to ask to see two flamingos that week. And, you know, and it's tangible. You can see if it's worked or not. And again, when it does work, your unconscious mind goes, OK, fine. That's another tick, another experience proving that maybe magic works. So I, I'll maybe ease up on the brakes next time, <laughs> right? Because, yeah, we have to work with what we have and our unconscious mind being uncomfortable with the fact that you're doing magic. It's definitely a thing. That actually leads to you touch on a great theme, something I know that David Rankin and Dr. Stephen Skinner have touched on that one of the first things when it comes to evocatory procedures that magicians should keep in mind is Location, location, location. And in one of your chapters of Hidden Paths, the magical self-care chapter, 
you share about, it's so important to think about where to practice magic and also the different relationships, you know, inviting a friend into your home versus, you know, someone who might be less familiar in different rooms in your home. Can you share why is it so uh, vital in a way to think about location and how, as you say, and I really love this, how spirits leave energetic signatures that you need to be aware of? Yes, yes, yes. You know, knowing that you should be aware of, of where you're evoking and actually not being an idiot like I am, are two different things. <laughs> because here's the thing, about three weeks ago, I guess, all right, bit of background, I'm not we're living at home at the moment. I'm living in temporary accommodation and I'm not in my usual environment. And so in my usual environment, I've got the place where I do my magic, and then I've got my living area, right? But here, I, I've kind of been on the back foot and, well, magic is a part of my life and, like, I completely forgot my own advice, right? So here's a, a good example. And, and I did some evocation in the front room, right, in the living room. Now, it just so happens that my wife and son have taken the bedroom because of my son's disabilities. He doesn't like to be in a new place on his own. And I sleep on the sofa, which happens to be in the living room. <laughs> right. Oh boy. Well, this is a very bad idea. So I, um, I did an evocation of a spirit that I'm, I'm not used to uh, inviting, right? I'm not sp used to having a, any kind of contact with. And trying to get the spirit to leave has been very, very tough. Very, very tough. And you know, as much as that wouldn't be a problem if I wasn't in that space at my most vulnerable, which is when I'm sleeping, right? <laughs> it wouldn't have been so much of a problem. But yes, if you have an option not to do magic in the place yeah, where you let your guard down, really, it's best not to, because even if that entity itself isn't sticking around, there's residue. <laughs> there is there's an energy that remains there. There was about five days without sleep, just constantly being woken up by loud buzzing noises, bursting into my chest and things like this. Like, Come on. <laughs> a tough five days. I did a complete cleansing of the entire environment. And even, even after that, it was a couple of days, maybe less. But yeah, it took quite a lot of effort to cleanse the place. Yeah. Be aware <laughs> of, of where you would do your evocation for sure. Would it be fair to say that someone with your vast experience, you know, no matter what level you're at, quote unquote level you're at, you are always learning. You are always gauging experience that this this journey really never is done. Would that be somewhat fair? Of course. I don't actually believe there's any such thing as an advanced magician. I think that we're Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're beginners wherever we are. If you've been practicing, actively practicing magic for 50 years, then yes, you've got more experience than, than somebody who's just getting started, but you're, you're a beginner still. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I think that there's also a big distinction between logic and things that you've learned by reading about them and by thinking about them. And yeah, just as you pointed out, the things that you experience for yourself, those are lessons that stay with you and that you tend to draw on a lot more than whatever it is you've, you've read or, or come to the conclusion of or, or whatever, right? Yeah. One of the reminders that you have in the book, and, and it's so important, is you know each of us enters under the giant esoteric umbrella, if you will, through, through different paths, you know, through maybe a different touch point, a different introduction. And I will confess, this is something I've, I've shared before, you know, of course, coming in interested in the grimoires and exploring Solomonic magic. So chaos magic was one of the farthest things from my mind. I have been woefully behind and ignorant of chaos magic. And this is one of the many, many good things about your book, because you say, quote, it's no secret that my approach to magic might be considered to be, in part at least, affiliated to chaos magic, unquote. There might be some listeners out there who 
might be hearing about chaos magic for the first time, what are some of the broad strokes or the key pillars of chaos magic? I guess Peter Cowell probably coined the term. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I think that's right. The thing is, many people go to Peter Cowell's books to learn about chaos magic and are a little bit surprised because he's really talking to lodge magicians. Right? He's not writing Liber Null and Psychonaut for the beginner magician. He's writing this as a critique of lodge magic. And so he assumes that the reader is a lodge magician and knows exactly what he's talking about. It's not necessarily the easiest introduction <laughs> to Chaos Magic. My introduction to Chaos Magic came through Robert Anton Wilson. <laughs> I mean, love him or hate him, I absolutely love the guy. Don't love all of his views, but I absolutely love his approach to magic. And it's actually through his work that I found out about Lon Milo Duquette, who I guess was probably my foot in the door <laughs> to the world of magic, right? Just before finding out about Lon Milo Duquette, yes, Robert Anton Wilson, who writes these two wonderful, many, many books, but these two particularly wonderful books, one called Prometheus Rising and the other called Quantum Psychology. And through these two books, he introduced me and many, many other people to the idea that you can take on a belief temporarily and it's okay. And this is going to sound completely impossible to people who haven't tried because of their experience with belief. Pretending to believe, by the way, is not the same thing as believing. The word belief itself has been so maligned by, I'm sorry, once again, the many Christian churches who have expected belief as a condition to not go to hell, right? If you don't believe, then you'll go to hell. And so, so many children grow up with this idea that, okay, I'm going to trick myself into believing that I believe or whatever, right? That's not belief, that's child abuse, right? It's, <laughs> But belief is when you agree full-heartedly that this is the way. I believe that the sun will rise in the morning, right? I believe that if I eat certain foods, it's going to be good for me, and if I eat other foods, it's going to be bad for me. I tend to believe naturally things that I've experienced, but it's also possible to take on a belief about something that you haven't experienced with enough practice. You can actually believe a thing wholeheartedly. That can be a really useful state to be in for certain magical practices. If you're evoking a particular entity from a particular pantheon, believing that the world works in the way that worshippers of that pantheon believed, Right? So taking on the belief that the sun is not the center of the galaxy, that actually we ourselves are the center of the galaxy. Oh, that's, that's actually an interesting point, isn't it? The heliocentric versus geocentric. I don't actually believe that magic is geocentric. I think that it's self-centric. Anyway, that's another story altogether. But anyway, it's possible to take on this belief during a particular working, during a particular ritual, for as long as it's useful, right? Because it's all mind, <laughs> then ultimately your belief does have an effect. It has a real tangible effect on how you interact with the universe, which is also mind, how you interact with spirits, which are also mind. Yeah, it all comes together, right? It all comes together this way. I'll just finish maybe with this quotation by Lon Miley Duquette that is, it's all in your mind, you just have no idea how big your mind is, which is so often mistaken to mean, oh, you think it's all just happening in your mind. But no, that second part of the quotation, you just don't realize, you just have no idea how big your mind is. It's all mind, that's the whole point. And so yes, your local mind has an effect on the world around you. Coming back to a previous question there, yeah. <laughs> I think, Denny, this follows another great point exactly that you bring up in the book, which is one of the many, many great points you share 
is that people can tie themselves into knots by saying things like, I'm a Gnostic, so how can I use the divine names in a grimoire if I'm really secretly calling the Demiurge, you know, or there's so many, there's an infinite number of these situations where people can tie themselves into knots. So to that point, and to your point about chaos magic and, and temporarily holding a belief, instead of tying yourself into knots or, or having anxiety about that, why is it so important to approach a ritual, a procedure, a grimoire on its own terms and to let that breathe, whatever that ritual is, to let it breathe on its own terms? Why is that so important? I think it relates directly to a question that we talked about earlier on, which is that our inner keyholes have to correspond to the keys that we're using for a particular ritual, our inner set, our inner assumptions, and so on. So it's important to be able to slip into whatever worldview is assumed of the magician for whom that particular ritual was created. If you're going to be using other people's rituals, of course, right? If you're going to be using a ritual from this civilization or from that period or from this place in the world or, or whatever, it's important, yes, to be the person for whom that ritual was created. So if you're learning through recipes, yes, it's important that you're the ingredient that that recipe assumes, right? Listeners, if you if you haven't already, one of the things that I love uh, both about Hidden Paths, Denny, and your videos is you you have this deep erudition and this lovely way of explaining things. And you also sprinkle in very important lessons, but with a dash of humor as well. So to this point, and this part made me chuckle in your book, who are the real mystics of social media? And, oh, and, boy. and why is it so important for us to, you know, never invalidate others' magical path because of perhaps our own insecurities that we might be projecting? But yes, who, who are the real mystics of social media? Oh, this was a beautiful term coined by one of the Patreons. So uh, there's a Foolish Fish Patreon and members of the Patreon get access to the Foolish Fish Discord. And in the very early days of interacting on this Discord, a wonderful member, Drew, brought up the point that he was in a bookshop, an esoteric bookshop, and was engaged in conversation with someone in the bookshop. And that someone asked Drew, what do you identify as in terms of magic, right? Well, what is your path? What is your tradition? Drew said, I, to be honest, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I, I guess I'm a pantheistic mystic, something like that. And the answer that he got was, oh, I wouldn't call yourself a mystic or the real mystics of social media will tear you apart. <laughs> <laughs> oh he had to take a, you know, to, to check to make sure that the person talking to him wasn't wasn't joking. But no, no, they weren't joking. And this is what I'm talking about earlier on. There's just so much criticism and judgment of other people in this world. It's shocking. It's shocking. And it's important to know how to build your shell and say, hey, sorry, that's not good enough for you. It's it's okay. It's not something wrong with me necessarily, right? I mean, it's also important to be able to work out, you know, what is the advice that could be useful for me? But yeah, it's also really important to know that people are not always out for your best interest. The advice doesn't always come from a place of love. Sometimes it's just people just saying something nasty to show that they know more than you do or whatever it is. It's, like, it's terribly unpleasant. <laughs> but I think that if we remind each other of this point from time to time, then it can be useful. One of the other ways you discuss this, again, this underlying theme, challenging materiality, talking about the vast mind, is another tutorial that you share about, both as on the Foolish Fish YouTube channel and in Hidden Paths, is sharing how people can cultivate the mind palace. What, Denny, is the esoteric and, and also the more practical value of cultivating a mind palace? Because I just love the way you describe, you know, building different rooms and having a fireplace. And I believe there was an avocado involved as well in, in one of the descriptions. <laughs> can, you, can you share a little bit about that? 
So I can't even remember about the avocado, but <laughs> but yes, for sure. So the Mind Palace, I guess Giordano Bruno is probably the big champion of the Mind Palace, and he used the Mind Palace to remember stuff, like big lists, and he would visualize a place in his mind, and he would go and place the things that he had to remember in a narrative in a particular room. Whenever he had to remember that particular list, he would go to that room, just walk around it, and find the things that he'd left there, and remember the narrative, and then he would have the whole list. It's a fantastic technique, and many people use it just for memory, and it's, it works really well. But the way I use it was recommended actually by a viewer who'd left a comment on one of my videos talking about how his uncle had taught him something like this when he was a child, and he kind of developed this into something much bigger and something much more powerful. His uncle had just taught him how to create a, a place that he would feel comfortable in, and then little by little would ask him to introduce useful new rooms, right? And for example, a, a safe room, and uh, this is a safe room that the particular viewer found very useful one day, right? And I found the safe room in my own mind palace very useful uh, sometime later when I was traveling to Paris with some very, very bad juju. <laughs> <laughs> it was a terrible, terrible experience. Like everything was going wrong. You can find out all about all the terrible things that happened during that journey. But one thing that I didn't mention in that video was that, you know, with all these things, everything that could go wrong going wrong, barriers not opening, stuff getting lost, anyway, just anything that could go wrong going wrong. And then we finally got to the Musée d'Orsay, and we put our coats down, we went around, and it was so cram packed that we couldn't actually see anything, so we actually left. We went to get my coat, and the system had broken down, and uh, they, they, they couldn't, they couldn't uh, get my coat for me. So yeah, just really, really bad situation, and I thought to myself, Do you know what? I'll just go up into my mind palace for a little bit, right? I'll go into my mind palace, and I'm going to hide. I'm just going to get off grid for a while. If there's anything that is trying to get at me, then it'll have lost me. And you know, I'll just stay here for just a few moments and see if that works. And well, along with another little thing that I did with a napkin, just that felt like the right thing to do. I made a like a little maze for the, whatever it might be to get lost in. It's one of those things that like vampires who like to count grains of sand, right? So anyway, I, I did something like this, and sure enough, the bad luck stopped, and the rest of the journey was just the best journey we ever had. So it can be useful in that way. Let me talk a little bit maybe about the Mind Palace itself, which is just a place that I decided to build. And so I just visualized a palace. And then I realized, no, I probably need to secure the place first. So I've created this big bubble, this secure bubble around it. And I give instructions on my, in my videos on how to do that. And there's like guided visualizations and things like this. The outcome is that I now have this place which is kind of stable, doesn't change very much anymore, with useful rooms, useful helpers, right? I've got a number of servitors up there that I'm always very glad to see when I visit, you know, and who clearly are glad to see me as well. There's a bit of give and take there. And there are these useful rooms. Sometimes if I don't have a good space for doing a particular ritual, then I'll go to a room in my mind palace to do that ritual. In my opinion, if you have the option to use the material world in a ritual, then it's best to do so because you're using more layers, more levels of the self. But in a pinch, then it's a good place to do a ritual if you need to do a ritual. And very often an easier place for the spirits to appear to you and actually have a have a conversation. So yes, I use my mind palace quite regularly and, uh, and I really appreciate that original viewer <laughs> who left the information on the on the comments. That was very cool. 
having that context and that visualization and i mean literally entire worlds opening up to you that that complement the malkuthian coil that we find ourselves in completely yeah there's one of the rooms that i know a lot of people appreciate my talking about which is the fireplace room right when i stopped being an it person very very luckily i was able to do this foolish fish thing full time which is just the biggest blessing and thank you very very much to all my supporters of course and to anyone who watches my videos it really helps but yes the point is that i was able to start looking after my child a bit more actively and more regularly so i was for the first time in my life a self-employed individual i didn't have a schedule set for me i I had to decide when I was going to be working and when I was not going to be working. And to be honest, when I started, probably like many people who become self-employed, there was no limit. You know, I'd be working from the moment I opened my eyes in the morning until the very last minute before going to bed, right? Interacting with new members, interacting on the Discord, talking to people in the comments trying to get some visibility on social media and so on and so forth trying to you know make something happen and then it didn't take very long for me to realize i can't keep this going right i can't keep this going and also make videos it's just too much so i, I really have to place limits on the beginning and the end of my day so that i'm really working in a very focused way during my working hours and then I really can make a cut at the end of the day and spend some time with my family, which is the whole point of my leaving my day job, right? I mean, it's, it really, really was the whole point. So I made this room in my mind palace and in this room there is a fireplace and very simple thing. At the beginning of the day, when I'm ready to start working, light a fire in the fireplace. And that means it's work time, <laughs> right? And I don't know, during the rest of the day, I'd be working very in a very focused way. And then just as an end ritual, really, I suppose, at the end of my work day, to go back to my inner palace and turn off the fire <laughs> and clean out the place, you know, so that it's ready for tomorrow kind of thing. I got a servitor to do the cleaning up <laughs> after a while. <laughs> But yeah, absolutely worked a charm. It was incredible. And then that got me into a pattern. And then I just didn't need to do that so much anymore after a while. Yeah, I did that for yeah maybe three or four months. Very, very cool stuff. We have a listener question for you, Denny from McKinley Valentine. And McKinley is asking Denny saying, question, the Foolish Fish YouTube channel reviews such a broad range of books that I actually have no idea what Denny's own magical practice involves or what his specific magical interests are other than good quality paper, quote unquote. If it's not private, McKinley is asking, I'd love to know what areas of magic Denny personally practices. So any anything to share on or elaborate on in addition to what you shared uh, earlier in the podcast? For sure, for sure. Very recently, I've discovered the work of Jareth Tempest. Jareth Tempest, I guess what he's done is that he's looked at the Gallery of Magic stuff and thought, okay, that's nice. Can I do my own take on this? I've read a couple of his books and I really, really like his approach. Maybe talking about the inner palace or visualization magic probably gives you the impression, probably the correct impression that I, I do enjoy engaging in visualization and Jareth Tempest's, he calls them path workings. I disagree that that's the best word for what he's doing here, but that doesn't matter. I really appreciate his process. What he does is that he gives you some visualizations to engage in, just maybe three or four in a row. And then after you've done these three visualizations, you call the name of a particular entity and you engage with that entity in a visualized way and the prerequisite for these visualizations for these what he's calling path workings is a first path working with the angel raziel and this particular path working which is free on his website i believe he actually shares it for free on his website although he does 
describe it at the beginning of his first book, Raziel's Paths of Power. I think that's the, the, the name of his first book. Anyway, it's a really, really nice way of approaching Raziel, who is known to be the go-between, <laughs> the angel who can get you in contact with, most traditionally, the 72 angels of the Shem HaMefarash. But my experience working with Raziel has been that Raziel has access to other entities as well. I've been really, really interested in Raziel's ability to point me to entities from other traditions altogether that have been completely on point, exactly the kind of the entity that I've needed. You know, I've been in situations over the past, yeah, I guess six months that I've been working with this system. And I've asked Raziel, listen, I'm in this particular situation. Is there a particular entity that you can direct me to? And uh, well, there was a particular time when everything was we were doing seemed to be blocked. And Raziel's answer was, have you tried Ganesh? And I was like, oh my God. I mean, of course. <laughs> Not what I was expecting. <laughs> but yes, a nice, easy practice. Of course, as long as you don't suffer from aphantasia, which is... You know, such a difficulty if you're engaging in magic with everyone saying, yeah, it's all about the visualizations. Of course, magic can be done without visualizations at all. But if you can use it, then yes, I certainly enjoy using visualized magic. There we go. Talk about breaking the correspondencies and breaking yes. those kind of rigid, concretized, petrified kind of 777, everything fits into a neat little box. It sounds like you were entering this malleability, this verdancy that, that was just so so perfect, as you said. Did you say it was on point, really, with what point. you found? Absolutely, absolutely. Very, very impressed. And it's, I mean, this is just one example, but really for the past six months, that's been my main go-to. Hey, Raziel, what's the right entity for this? And you know, sometimes mm. it'll be an entity I've never heard of and I'll do some research and I'll be like, okay, maybe if I change the spelling, like, oh yeah, no, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Really cool. Yeah. Thank you so much, McKinley, for the, for the excellent question. We got some great comments from listeners. You know, they were so excited and they, they love the Foolish Fish YouTube channel and they were so excited you were coming on. And we also had a listener comment that I just wanted to read here. And, and if you have any thoughts, a listener comment from one of the patrons, uh, Vincent Ruizers. And I, I am so sorry, Vincent, for probably butchering your last name. But Vincent has a great comment and saying, quote, I'm excited to listen to this undoubtedly great conversation you'll have together. I've learned a lot from your videos, Denny. And I've actually named a song, Denny, after your YouTube channel. I hope the YouTube algorithm heard my intention to bring more eyes to your work. Thank you for everything you do. And that goes for you too, Alex. And gosh, Vincent, thank you. And Denny, yeah, oh, I mean... How, how lovely. Thank you, Vincent. I'm really touched. <laughs> <laughs> That's really lovely. Thank you. Such an honor for me to be on the Glitch Bottle podcast, which has taught me so much. I mean, so, so much. I've been listening since... And not quite the beginning, but I've heard all the beginning episodes, of course. And uh, really, Alex, your work is so important in the whole environment. I was telling my mum this morning that being on the Glitch Bottle podcast for me is very much like attending the Oscars. You know, it's like <laughs> the oh, highest geez. honor I could possibly imagine. <laughs> I really, really appreciate it. I'm so glad we're not doing video for this because now it's my turn to, <laughs> to turn bright red and, and blushing. Um, well, that is that is very kind. But truly, I mean, the, the amount that I've learned from you, Denny, has been it's it's been so great. I mean, I, I think of it as so many of your videos lay the base of the pyramid, if you will, of like, hey, these are key things that all esotericism is built on. But then you you have the specificity and this granularity that just really explores whether it's step by step tutorials, whether it's taking one specific esoteric concept and just really getting in there with the different folds and the different variations. It's it's so lovely. And Denny, one of the things that I really am looking forward to hearing your thoughts on as well, in addition to everything else, is you are so well informed. You know about things when I watch your videos, you know, whether it's new esoteric books, new concepts, you are so in tune with different trends and things like that. So where, Denny, do you think the future of esotericism 
is headed. You know, we, we of course recently have heard things like we're in a grimoire Renaissance and, you know, there's chaos magic and, and, you know, different astrological approaches, divination. Where do you think we're headed? What do the next five or 10 years look like? Any, any major trends or anything that, that comes to mind? I think that despite my best efforts, we're not getting any less materialistic. Mm, <laughs> I yeah. think that we're probably going into a even more of, you know, this is how it's done. If you do it any differently, then you're not doing it the perfect ideal way. I think, unfortunately, that's what I'm seeing more and more people heading towards, right? It's just human nature, I think. Uh, I think it's going to take a little while for us to shift that, if that's even a shift that people want. It's certainly a shift that I want. I think that it's not impossible that the Greco-Egyptian magical papyri are going to start making a bit more of an appearance in people's everyday conversations about magic more than lodge magic, right? I think that lodge magic is falling out of favor. I think more and more people are starting to think of it as just social clubs rather than actual places to learn great magic. And yes, I think that there being more and more high quality practitioners who are exposing the world to the Greco Egyptian magical papyri, which is it's a usable set of rituals and spells that go back quite a long way. And people really do like old stuff, right? There's this idea that the older it is, the more authentic and the more authoritative it is. So, yes, I think that Greco Egyptian magical papyri magic is going to become more and more fashionable. Jack Grail's PGM course, and now he's announced his second part to this course, is doing such fantastic service to this corpus of texts. And I think people are going to engage with Jack Grail's view on it. There are so many people taking the course and then sharing that information within the community that's going to be seen by more and more people and going to start being the zeitgeist, I think, I think, yeah. And that is quite separate from what I said earlier on about uh, we're going towards more and more materialism in this context, but I think that it's not incompatible with that materialism. So the way it works, the reason why the PGM works is another thing altogether, right? But the PGM itself coming into favor, I think that that's something we're going to see more and more. The world of esotericism, it's ever-changing. It's so vast. There's always new publications. Thank goodness there are channels like yours, like Foolish Fish, <laughs> because they you funnel, you sift, you delineate, you categorize, you break down. And I think that is so lovely. What two or three magical tips or overall advice would you like to leave listeners with? I mean, based on our conversation, the Denny Poisson list, if I were to put one together, you know, it would include things like, take your time. You will know when it's the right time. There's not just one way to do magic. Be open-minded. Explore the vast mind. You've touched on so many things. What are two or three magical tips or, or pieces of advice that you'd like to leave listeners with? I think the most important thing is to not be afraid of magic. People see magic as this terrifying thing, and it's because of the image that's being given to magic, of course, but many people really embrace that kind of scary, edgy image. They really like it. You don't have to you know, be a particular kind of person to do magic. I think that we're doing magic all the time, in fact. It's just that we may not be aware that we're doing magic and we need to be just honing our magic skills. We need to be learning that when we do this, there are these kinds of effects. And when we do that, there are those kinds of effects. But I think that if we understand the magic or not, we're still doing magic all the time. So don't be afraid of magic. Magic is just about understanding that the things that we do, the things that we say, the things that we think, they have an effect, and magic is about getting them to have the effect that you, in fact, want. So choosing the right actions, the right thoughts, the right words. This is why I say that actually meditation is a prerequisite to magic. That's not to say that, you know, if you're not meditating, you won't be able to do magic. And in fact, 
you know, maybe people in the past who didn't have quite so hectic lives didn't need to meditate, and you know, because their lives were were quite simple and their minds weren't drawn this way and that. But nowadays, yes, I think that if you can control your mind and get it to do the things that you want it to do, and learn that placing your mind in this way, or placing your mind in that way, and saying words this way with this intention, or whatever else, it has a specific effect, and you don't have to be engaging in entities you don't like. There's nothing compulsory about engaging with angels or engaging with demons or anything in between. You know, it's <laughs> you can choose. The magic that you like, you can choose your favorite kind of magic, and then start there, and then decide that you want to experiment a little bit and experiment, see if it works for you, and decide. Oh my goodness, no! What I've been doing is nowhere near what I want to be doing from now on. I want to be doing something else completely. You know, I can see that there's loads more power doing this kind of stuff, and yeah, so sure, spend a bit of time doing that stuff. But getting hung up about, you know, I should be doing this, or it's not scary enough, or it's too scary, or anything like this. Just, just do the thing that you're comfortable with. Yeah, I love that. I love that. It reminds me of a point you brought up earlier too about, as opposed to the acquisition of external information, there's something so deep about when you do something with intentionality. Your own experience lays the patterns and the groundwork and the bedrock that you can then build upon. Yes, yes, that works absolutely. I'm a little bit aware of how much new age material has taken on this. It's all about intention. Well, <laughs> no, intention is one of the ingredients. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it, I think it's important to understand that. Yeah, again, that same message that the practitioner is one of the ingredients of the magic. Listeners, what amazing wisdom! What amazing experiences that are being shared, both with Hidden Paths and with uh, all of the videos that Denny does on the Foolish Fish YouTube channel. Where can people find you and support you? Again, I know this is a silly question as, as millions have checked out your videos and, and I know so many people reading uh, Hidden Paths. I can say, listeners, as a member of Denny's Foolish Fish Patreon, patreon.com slash foolishfish, it's wonderful. You get awesome access. There's excellent information, really cool perks. In addition to the Patreon, Denny, how else can people support you and where can they find you? Well, actually, I do one-to-one -one consultations, one-hour consultation. There are different types of consultation, but ultimately, when the consultation happens, it's just a conversation. I do tarot readings, use various oracles, but ultimately, many people reach out to me asking me for advice for their particular situation. What books should I read to go to the next step? Or what am I doing wrong? You know, my way of thinking isn't leading me in the direction that I want it to lead me. You know, what what am I doing wrong? Well, you know, have I have I missed a step or something like this? That's definitely something that a lot of people seem to appreciate. And the Patreon really is the thing that keeps the lights on, that's for sure. There is also this thing called YouTube memberships. I do tend to prefer Patreon actually because YouTube, they're amazing at sharing my information and making the videos available, but they do like to take quite a big cut. <laughs> yeah, it's the, way, it's the way it goes. So if you have the choice, then yeah, for sure, Patreon is my preferred version. Just anyone watching my videos on the YouTube channel called Foolish Fish, and of course the book out quite recently called Hidden Paths through Black Letter Press. Those are the main ways to support me, <laughs> yeah. and I really, really appreciate everyone who does support me. Just a big thank you to all. Practitioner, author, esotericist, the proprietor of the excellent and wonderful Foolish Fish YouTube channel, and the author of Hidden Paths from Black Letter Press, Denny Poisson. Denny, Thank you so, so much for taking the time and sharing your wisdom and your felt presence of direct experience on the podcast today. Really, really appreciate it. The pleasure is absolutely mine, Alex. Thank you so much for a lovely talk. 
just wow, listeners and patrons. I could have listened to Denny for many, many more hours. What a great insight into how someone can walk their own esoteric path. And even though we're all individuals, of course, I really, really appreciated all of the commonalities and universal tips and lessons that Denny shares. Certainly things that we can all take to heart and try out for ourselves. So make sure, listeners, check out the links below to subscribe to Foolish Fish on YouTube. Also to see vital videos that Denny recommends that share key magical concepts and also for ways to support Denny on Patreon.com. It is so important that we support people who are leading the way in esotericism. And speaking of Patreon, a huge thanks to each and every Glitch Bottle patron over at patreon.com slash Glitch Bottle. You are the reason the podcast continues to grow in new and interesting ways. As always, this is Alexander Eth reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light.